All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Sakhar Hussain, and I'm representing BRAC. Uh, welcome to the world's biggest family. Uh, just to put things in perspective, uh, BRAC uh, ranked number one NGO in the world, and last year it was ranked at, uh, in 2016 also, including the three years. Our vision is a world free from all forms of exploitation and discrimination, where everyone has their opportunity to realize their potential. Uh, as one of our presenter, our program head, Profulada, uh, presented to you guys earlier about our non-formal primary school. We are currently working in over 12 different nations, education, health, microfinance, all across in development vectors. So that leads to today's presentation, Bragg Boat School, right? So before I get into the program, I wanted to talk about one of my friends, Tanzina. So I met Tanzina about five months ago. I went to visit a boat school. And the moment you meet her, she's one of these person that you know you will be a better person in life by getting to meet her. She's just finishing up fifth grade today, this year and will take her uh, primary exam at the end of the year. And I stayed two days to work with the boat school program for another project. And she's fun, she's exciting, she's confident. Every time she walks into a room, she owns it. But she wasn't like this. When she started on grade one as a boat school student, she was very timid, scared. Uh, her mother passed away when she was born. Her father got married a few months back. And as she grew old, being the oldest in the family, her responsibility became everything but education. And even if she had the opportunity to go to school, the biggest challenge for her and many of her students, uh, her friends were getting to school. And that comes to our next thing. Where Tanzina lives in Bangladesh is the low-lying areas of Bangladesh, where most of the lands are underwater for six to eight months of the year, especially during the monsoon season. So we have government schools that are free, but these schools are so far away for marginalized communities like these, these people, that getting to a school actually becomes dangerous. For Tanzina to go to the closest government school, she had to take a boat, then go to the road, walk a few miles, take another boat, then get to the school. So it, within all that, she had to do just to get to the school and then have to come back. So boat school, it was, going to a normal, regular school just wasn't a luxury. It became impractical. So like we said, the Hau region in Bangladesh uh, is underwater for six to seven months of the year. Uh, and the permanent schools that are already exist, they're usually in pretty bad shape. And given the location and natural disaster, government tends to spend less, time, less money on this school to uh, renovate them. And this is where a boat school came in. We launched it in 2011 with 10 schools. And then as of right now, we have over four, 500 schools, uh, sorry, 400 boats with 500 classes serving over 14,000 students. And over 50% of them are girls and serving 15 districts in Bangladesh. The way boat school works is it's based on our non-formal primary school model. Our non-formal primary school takes the government primary school, which is five years, and shrinks it to four years. And our students are allowed to then take part in government exams after the four years. So we took that education model and brought it to the both schools, right? Uh, what makes this school unique besides having it on a boat, right? The both school, rather than students having to come to school, we pick up the students from their uh, houses because the flood lines get so high that the waters are literally next to their houses in areas during the monsoon season. So we pick up the students, and then we bring them to some on higher land area. We anchor our boat, have the classes, then drop the students off by the boat on a day-to-day -day basis. Right? And when we decide to open a school on a specific area, before we open, we talk to the parents and the community. And we ask them what uh, school hours work for them, depending on the location. So it's extremely flexible when the school starts, when the school st ends. So during the monsoon season, when the flood line is really high, our hours changes. And then when the four months out of the year, when the floods are low and the lands are open and 
parents can actually go work on the field, we realized that these children will go end up working on the field with their parents. So we then talked to them and we rescheduled the hours again. All our school, not just both school, all our primary school are run by 100% female teachers. When we initially started the program, we had male female teachers, but after a few years, we realized the impact women teachers have on them is much higher than the male teachers. And these are also teachers that are from within communities. So these are not just teachers that these students see for a couple hours a day and then they're gone. These teachers they see throughout the day, even after the end of the classes. So they're not just a teacher anymore, they become a family member. They have interaction in a much deeper level than just, that's just beyond, that goes beyond the classroom environment. Um, obviously we have the monthly parent teachers meeting, but for each both school we also have what we call school management committee. And what this is, is a seven member committee where the teacher, few parents, and two to three prominent member of the community take part in it. And they have a monthly meeting. And that goes beyond just classroom activities or teaching. They kind of talk about what are the challenges the both schools facing, what else can they provide to the students. So it's a holistic approach that supports the students. We also have customized uh, books for grade one, two, three, which supplements the government books. And the reason for that is that government books tend to be quite difficult for students who never attended school or who are dropped out. So we created books that make sense much simpler without losing quality of the education, right? And we have additional materials and mini libraries and few other things with our both schools. Uh, we have been quite successful in Bangladesh. So we scaled up the program in Philippines within BRAC. We started the program in 2014 at the ARMM regions. Uh, one of the main difference between both school in Philippines and Bangladesh is that the target uh, people for Bangladesh are marginalized for socioeconomic reason. These people actually does not have access to school. But our target community for Philippines is the marginalized people. They have access to school, but the communities are very, um, What's the word for it? They're not very welcoming to this crowd. So they don't have an open space to come to school. It's not welcoming for them. So we created a school for them that leads to giving them the opportunity to have education. Currently in Philippines, we have seven both schools with 200 students. Uh, they're finishing up grade three. And that being said, thank you.